CN140. That type of mask we don't see too much at the moment, and certainly not for the COVID uh, pandemic. That is a mask that has external uh, filter uh, elements on it that you can replace. But to have an overview of all that's possible at the moment, I give it here. Maybe in the future, some new groups will arise here, but now we identified five ones. Now let's uh, talk something about uh, the standards that you have. For the first two groups, the artisan masks and the community mask, there's no real standard for that. But you have a document that's called the CWA document uh, that's given here in the, the slide, where some uh, instructions are given how to make these type of masks, what to do, what not to do, and things like that. We know that in the future, maybe there will come a European standard for that, but that's for next year. Then the, the third group are the medical masks. Then you have the standard EN14683. I just give the numbers. Eh? Persons that are involved in the production of these know what's behind. And even in the next part of the presentation, uh, equipment will be shown and things like that to do the testing. For the FFP mask is the EN149. And then for the, the fifth group is the EN140. So that's about testing. Now the next step is to go to a certification. Now for the first two types, the artisan and the community, you have no certification, no CE certification that's possible. For the third group, the medical or surgical mask, you can. So you have to test according to the standard and then you have a CE auto certification. That means that you don't need an external party. You don't need a notified body to realize the CE dossier. For the next two groups, the FFP and the EN140 masks, you need a notified body uh, that helps you to prepare the CE dossier. So that's a big difference with uh, the third group. If you have some questions about your type of mask that you're producing and what you want or what you need to do about testing or uh, the CE certification, you can contact one of the partners of the consortium. They know how to deal with this. Then during the COVID period in Belgium, the Belgium government made a possibility to uh, give permission for uh, masks that are not really conform the, the standards they need to be conform with, to use these masks during only the COVID period, only for uh, medical uh, or health workers. So you can't sell them everywhere. And you have two groups. You have the FFP masks. There you have, a, you have an alternative testing protocol and also for the surgical masks that are just temporary solutions and we know in the future that they will disappear. So that's a, a way to fast uh, check if they comply or not comply with the basic requirements they need at the moment. Then the last slide, we know also that uh, in the Belgium landscape in Flanders also we are very innovative, so we will see quite a lot of new developments. Eh? But the thing I showed you was what is already present on the market. But I see a lot of companies that are looking towards a uh, mask with uh, additional properties, like for example, the antiviral properties. So now the question there is, how do we have to go for a CE certification for these masks? Or what do we have to do? Because there is no real standard for that. So, and there we made a conclusion. Eh? You have to check the standard mask properties according to the EN standard as most appropriate for that type of mask. Then the antiviral properties include that you have to do a registration as a biocide also. So you need to be aware for that. Then another thing eh, that we may not uh, lose is that we have also to check for uh, side products that can be formed by the antiviral function that's on the mask and also to look if the active compounds uh, that for example realize the antiviral uh, working of the mask are not released from the mask and even if there are maybe some health threats associated with the active compounds that are coming out of the mask or the side products that are formed so that's more complex. And so we know what to do there at the moment. So if you have some questions there, you can contact, for example, Vito. 
Another question we see now more and more because 3D printing is very popular in our regions is that they make masks based on the shape of your own face. Now, there is no real uh, European standard for that. So what's the solution? We have to test the mask according to the most appropriate EN standard, but for a standard uh, shape of that mask. And in the next step, you have to contact a notified body to prepare the CE dossier, like with the standard masks. But an additional step is there. So the notified body will take an additional task. They will audit the procedures for making the individual masks, and they will also do inspections at the company at some times to look how the procedures are uh, applied. So I hope this will help you because it was for us also a way to look to the right solution here. But now I think we are there. So that's it. Let's go to the next speaker. Uh, Nico, can you take it over for me? Yes, so I see I, we have already quite some questions in the chat. As I mentioned, we will uh, have all the questions afterwards because I see questions that might also uh, be solved uh, with the next speakers uh, presenting. Just okay. Good morning. I hope my presentation is visible also. Oh, uh, okay. okay, thanks. Then I will start because in uh, in about ten minutes uh, I will try to give an overview of the different tests that are involved in FFP masks. Uh, as Jeroen already mentioned, most of the items concerning uh, certification. Uh, so I will very, very briefly just touch that, uh, that topic. Now, first of all, uh, what is an FFP? Uh, well, most uh, most new information for me uh, concerning the the FFP was was the acronym. Uh, Something that I need to check sometimes. It's it's well an FFP is a filtering face piece mask, uh, and they have different types. Eh? They have the cups uh, version. They have the threefold, twofold, the Chinese like. Um, as most of you already know, they come in different qualities. The FFP one, two, and three, and the higher the number, the better the uh, protection that they supply. They can be valved or non-valved. Uh, for the COVID crisis, we focus mainly on the non-valved uh, version, since uh, the valved one isn't as safe uh, to to the other people. Uh, so in the COVID crisis, we mostly see non-valved. Um, they are either reusable or non-reusable. Uh, most on uh, most of the masks on the market are the non-reusables. That's the one that you only wear for about four to eight hours, and then you throw them uh, away. Uh, but we see some questions, some some trials, and they definitely are on the market to have reusables. Uh, but I'll go into more detail that later on. Um, and there is also a version which is called the Option D. Uh, it's a mask that's uh, resistant to a lot of dolomite uh, since the FFP masks they originate from construction work and mining work uh, so that's uh, something historical uh, but nevertheless also still important so as mentioned uh, at the moment we mainly look at FFP non-reusables uh, sometimes with the dolomite option uh, and non-valved but the presentation will touch on all and is valid for all um, masks Good. As you uh, mentioned, uh, in Belgium, uh, in the Corona crisis in the beginning of uh, last, uh, beginning of this year, there was a lot of shortage of masks. So the federal government uh, decided to implement an alternative test protocol. Uh, I've seen a question in the chat uh, arriving that, well, how long does that alternative test protocol uh, will be valid? Eh? 
Well, actually, we don't know that for sure. Uh, in the summer, there was already mentioning that we were right. That was that was very limited. Uh, and in the summer, they said, well, it will be till the the month of September. Uh, when September came, it will be it would be the end of the year. And yeah, at the moment, that's still valid. Uh, so we don't know uh, that for sure how long that will still be be valid. So that's the alternative test protocol. Uh, there are some links uh, in the slide which you can then uh, click uh, when when you um, when you get the presentation with a lot of more information, uh, specific information on the ATP uh, protocol. No, that's on the one side. On the other side, there is the, the EN149, uh, what we call the full test uh, to test RFP masks. Um, but there is also something in between. Uh, those that are interested know that there is some type of COVID FFP2 mask uh, that's all in, and it's a recommendation in, in Europe uh, to be able to to make uh, special RFP masks, uh, but also that's for a limited time, a limited duration, uh, and and also the tests has has some uh, some limitations, uh, uh, and in certain companies uh, in certain countries they already stopped with it. But I just mentioned it's since it's something in between the ATP and the uh, and the full uh, test. Um, now, as as you mentioned, you have the ATP uh, currently, uh, which is performed by four labs in uh, in Belgium, uh, and the EN 149. Uh, it's done uh, by the full test. It's done by well, at the moment eleven uh, labs. Uh, now, after Brexit, eh? we don't know how that will work out. Uh, most likely, there will be only uh, nine uh, uh, line labs in Europe that do the full EN149, uh, in which V2 is one of those uh, select group. Good. Um, just some general slides to, to, to give an overview. Uh, well, we live in Europe. We, we all know the FFP, FFP3, uh, FFP3. Three FFP3 masks, uh, but we are not alone in the world, of course. Uh, uh, in different continents, different uh, countries, they have similar tests, they have similar masks, uh, and they have, they have different names. Uh, so just here a slide to, to give an overview of, of masks that compare to a certain uh, extent to the masks that, that we use here in in Europe, uh, most of uh, of all, most known are those uh, from uh, from the USA, like for example the N95 or the KN95 from uh, from China. Uh, 95 standing for the the filter efficiency of the mask. So there, the higher the number, the better uh, filtration efficiency that you have. Uh, good. Uh, First of all, a small overview of the different tests that you have within the EN 149. Uh, on the left side, I just mentioned uh, some some smaller tests, uh, which I will touch very briefly. And on the right side, uh, there are the five main most important tests, uh, and I will uh, give those a little more uh, attention. Good. Uh, now, before going to the to the test, just mentioning also, uh, especially for those uh, people interested in developing masks, that uh, in order for the mask to qualify, uh, they only don't need to just pass the test. They need to uh, be able to withstand certain conditioning of the masks. Uh, certain masks are tested as we receive them. Other are uh, first temperature conditioned um, with temperatures of 70 uh, degrees Celsius, but also minus 30. Uh, so that's an important thing to note that you have need materials that that can withstand those temperatures. Uh, also, that uh, for a lot of the tests uh, before the the masks are tested, we they are exposed to what we call simulated wearing, uh, and they were put they will be put on on a on a model head and uh, with a special breathing machine uh, the the mask will be yeah, used in the moist uh, humid air for about uh, 200 minutes uh, with a fairly high flow um, so so to see how they can withstand long uses 
uh, there is a flow conditioning if you have a valved mask uh, and also need uh, the mask to be able to withstand mechanical strength. Uh, so uh, we built uh, an instrument that we call Tower of Terror uh, and it simulates a drop of 200 times for the masks. So they need to be some, uh, some. Uh, they need to be quite robust to withstand that uh, that test, and that's just a conditioning test before we do the other tests. Um, good. Um, one of the things also in the EN standard uh, is is a specification on, on what kind of information that needs to be supplied. Uh, there is certain information that needs to be in the mask, there is certain information that needs to be in the manual, and certain information that needs to be on the box. And it's very, very strict. For example, if, if the manual uh, comp um, accompanying the, the, the mask isn't in the language of the user, eh? and, and in, in Belgium that means Dutch, French, um, uh, and German, uh, mask won't be allowed to be sold in uh, in Belgium. Uh, and hey, that's, for example, one of the things uh, which currently most non-EU masks fail, uh, hey, especially the, 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 the Dutch uh, version of the of the manual. Uh, but also what's in the manual uh, and, and, for example, how long uh, the mask can be stored, on what condition they need to be stored, that all needs to be in the, the information. No. Um, as mentioned, uh, before going to the, the, the big tests, the, they, have, uh, they have some, some smaller tests involving practical performance, compatibility with skin, uh, evaluation of the head harness, field of vision. Um, but just one that I want to, to mention specifically is also your masks need to be resistant to a flame. Uh, you can wonder how that's relevant in current crisis, since most of the masks will be used by healthcare workers. But yeah, it's something that's in the standard and something that needs to uh, be complied. Otherwise, the, the, uh, the masks will fail. So not all material, uh, even though that it has, it might have a good filtration efficiency and so, is suitable for the for making a mask. Now, good. Uh, now I'll run. Also, very briefly, to five of the main tests that uh, that we need to perform and why. Uh, the first of all, first is the carbon dioxide test. Uh, since you, most of the people that 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 have worn uh, these types of masks know that well, if they they aren't a good kind, you sometimes have 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 some some loss of of air eh? that, that needs to be eh, especially for those people that are a little bit claustrophobic that might po that might give a problem uh, but also that what we test here in, in in this test is that the carbon dioxide that we all exhale is sufficiently ventilated uh, so we don't breathe in our own air uh, so that's a specific quite complex uh, test in which we post here a test uh, setup now the second uh, test, well, and that's the main known test, uh, is the testing of the filter penetration, uh, in which we test uh, just the filter material. Uh, we clamp the mask in a, in a device, so it, there are no no leakage and no fit, and we we use diff two different types of test aerosols to test uh, the filter efficiency. And it's based on those numbers that your mask will be classified either as an FFP1, 2 or 3. Uh, just to mention, as for the FFP2 masks, uh, the filter penetration um, needs to be lower than 6%. Uh, it's and the test is done both by sodium chloride and both by paraffin. Uh, the one is a smaller aerosol; it's dry, uh, it's more statically charged, uh, while the other is larger, uh, it's more liquid and less static uh, charged. Now, when I say larger, it's not as large as the test needs to be performed by the community mask, but. Um, I think Mark will uh, will mention that uh, later on. Uh, but there are two different types of aerosols, and it's possible that one of the aerosols is is harder to catch by the mask, and it needs to pass both examinations. So that's definitely one of the uh, important uh, tests. 
Uh, a third one, uh, and perhaps even harder for the masks, is the total inward leakage test. It's a test in which we use 10 test persons. Uh, we put them on a treadmill, we give them a mask, and we, uh, we, we connect a lot of tubing to the masks to be able to test inside the mask and outside of the mask and to see well actually what goes through the mask when when people are using it so we just we don't only test the filter material but we also test the the face seal leakage possibly an exhalation valve leakage if it's uh, present uh, and we do that by by using 10 people with different face characteristics uh, and that's 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 the real life test and eh? so this is the test how the mask will perform in real life uh, we do it on a treadmill by walking uh, looking left and right up and down talking and then again walking uh, it's again done by sodium chloride and with a very specific uh, instrument uh, and also mentioning that uh, for this, uh, this might be a detail, but it's different from the ATP protocol, is that here we only measure during the inhalation phase. Uh, so we want to have a true vision on, on how the mask uh, performs. Um, now, uh, even though that the test looks fairly simple to perform, the evaluation is uh, less so. Uh, because as with the filter penetration test, that when all masks need to comply to a 6% uh, penetration for the FFP2 mask, um, for, the, for the tilt test, that's different. Uh, since we have 10 tests, test subjects uh, and we have five exercises so we actually have 50 results uh, not all results need to comply to a certain standard uh, and even there this is the standard difference so for all the 50 individual uh, results uh, 46 need to have a result for an FFP2 mask of 11 percent so there are possibly even four uh, tests that have an, an inward leakage of more than 10 percent so that's important to know and as also uh, to be honest to the people that are using mask is there is no zero risk and uh, supposedly you you're wearing a mask and you're working in hospital and you're turning over a COVID patient to to treat the the wounds for example uh, and you're doing some mechanical labor uh, you're, you're a little bit need to be rough because it's a heavy person uh, it's possible that in that case the mask doesn't fit as good and then you're close to the to the patient and it's possible that your inward leakage is higher than 10 percent so also there is no zero risk but uh, that's also one of the reasons why we are very very strict in evaluation this test uh, since we want to have to have certainty that that uh, the quality of the mask is reliable okay good uh, perhaps a little bit faster on on and another test is the breathing resistance uh, if you are ever worn an FFP2 mask uh, a good one, eh? not the not uh, AliExpress China version uh, KN95, but the true FFP mask. You will notice that it 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 a little bit more laborious to to breathe. Uh, so there are also limitations on on the the air resistance uh, of a specific uh, masks. Um, Good. Uh, and lastly, it's the what we call the it's the clogging test. Uh, it's mandatory only for the reusable masks. So in most cases, uh, we don't need to perform this on on a mask that we need to evaluate. Uh, but it's important to know, and especially uh, in, in in Dutch, they have have a nice uh, they have a nice word uh, for floating around uh, mask. Eh? It's zwerfkapje. Uh, the the, the, the uses of, of, of non-reusable masks isn't really the most sustainable uh, way. So people have been looking in, in reusable masks, uh, in sterilization of masks, especially in, in the period of shortage. Uh, but know that if you're planning on making a reusable mask, 
Yeah, whether or not it, it is a 3D printed or, or some other innovative way uh, and you want to have it reusable, uh, know that then the clogging test is mandatory. Now, the clogging test means that you, you with a breathing machine, you load the mask with about 1.5 grams of dust. Uh, that's why it's, it's, it's a picture of, 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 uh, of, a, of a ventilation duct in which the, the, uh, the sampling has it's located. Uh, here you see that the, the dust after just one test run. So that's why we then call this test the Operation Desert Storm, uh, but especially important for those people that are interested in reusable uh, masks. Now, uh, let me finally conclude with, with just uh, the reason why that we do the things that we do, not only as a lab, lab in this crisis, but also in, in this project is, okay, first of all, uh, we want to ensure that there are enough good masks, there are enough safe masks, uh, but this project goes further. Eh? Uh, and as seen by a picture I stole from the internet uh, of a Facebook post of a few months ago, um, those people that need to wear the mask day in, day out, uh, they also need to have, well, let's call them better masks. Uh, because if you've been wearing those masks, you will see the, the lesions and the, the stress it poses on the skin uh, of the healthcare uh, workers. Okay, I think that's uh, very, fast, uh, perhaps too fast uh, overview of the FFP2 masks. Uh, no, this one I will skip. Uh, of course, the acknowledgement. And if you uh, need to get in contact with us. Um, also, just to mention that in the rest of the presentation, uh, but it will be mentioned also in the, in, in the further one, in, in the rest of the presentation, we will not focus on comfort uh, testing of the FFP2 mask, since it's, well, as you have seen with all the tests, they're quite technical uh, and, and dedicated. Uh, so it's fairly hard to, to do that uh, comfort testing in a, in a broad sense. So if you have any question concerning uh, FFP2 mask uh, development, especially in, in, the, uh, in the sector of comfort, improved comfort and so on, I think most likely it will be best to contact uh, the consortium uh, and then we will look at, uh, at comfort uh, just in a one-of-one -on -one, uh, relation. Okay. Yes, thank you, thank Nico. You, Nico. We will we proceed now, now with the presentation the on the medical, medical masks. If Mark can uh, share his yes. presentation. Hello, good morning. Everything fine? Can hear and see everything? Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, we saw the testing of uh, one of the categories, so the FFP mask. This presentation will handle uh, shortly the testing and classification of medical surgical face masks. Um, so, a surgical mask, uh, which is very important to state, is not to protect yourself, but to protect uh, uh, everybody else around you from being infected or uh, in the general sense, the, the basic use of a surgical mask, of course, was was before this crisis only in the hospitals. Uh, nobody would be thinking about wearing this on the streets, of course, but yeah, times change. So, um, and these are or were worn only to protect patients during interventions, during operations, of course, from uh, getting uh, additional infections during these uh, during these surgeries or uh, or uh, interventions by doctors and nurses. So that's very important to know so that they were ne they were never um, intended to be used to protect yourself. So also uh, the, the basic um, protection was to, to against larger droplets and not to small uh, um, aerosols or small sized particles, for example. Also, 
Um, the standard which I will be talking about was already briefly mentioned, so the EN14683. So it was developed um, to show uh, compliance of these products with uh, legislation, which is generally the case for our standards, and to be able to put a CE mark on the packaging or on the product itself, depending on the requirements. So in this case, it's uh, to show compliance as it is considered a medical device, not to protect yourself, but to protect the patient during an intervention. So it's considered a medical device, class one, just to be more clear. So according to either the medical device directive, which is still uh, um, in, in, in running uh, of next year, it's supposed to be this year, but because of this uh, crisis, this was the actual start of the uh, medical device regulation. So the new legislation on, on European level will start officially uh, next May uh, in 2021. So what are the requirements as prescribed by the EN 146A3? Here you have them uh, summarized. So the first and uh, most important, of course, is that you need to filter the, uh, the contamination. In this case, bacterial filtration uh, efficiency is checked. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to be suffocated when wearing a mask, so you need to have a certain breathability uh, to combine those. It's not always easy, as we notice now. Um, in some cases, there is also an additional protective parameter added. It's called the type 2R mask, where uh, in, in certain cases, the surgeon needs to be, it's a big word is protection. It's just, uh, it's, it's more a comfort property. Honestly, it's like to pre pre uh, protect uh, the passage of potential uh, um, physical liquids, uh, let's say blood, to be uh, penetrating the mask uh, from outside in. So this is uh, a mixed uh, interpretation of the, so this can, in my view, sometimes uh, bring confusion, but okay, it's, it's added to uh, as an additional uh, property for some types of uh, surgical masks. And then another one, which is sometimes, um, maybe a little bit mis, uh, or forgotten or given less importance, but for me it's rather important. It's actually what it should be supposed to be clean also the mask. So it's, uh, they are not supposed to be used sterilized. So the masks are used as is, as they come out of the factory, as they are packaged there. So they need to be, have a little, a limited amount of microorganisms on them which means uh, that we have to check the microbial cleanliness. And then uh, another one, the final one is biocompatibility, but that's honestly, that's a, a basic requirement, which is actually noted in the actual legislation. So that's a requirement for all medical devices which come into contact with any part of the body of a patient. So these are the the requirements uh, from the latest version, which was published in 2019. Uh, just uh, background information, Centex Bell is an active partner in development and, uh, uh, and the revision of these standards. Um, so you see that there are uh, three types of masks, type 1, 2 and 2 R. Type 1 is generally, as you see in the remark below in the table, is, is supposed to be used uh, for patients and other persons to reduce the risk of spread of infections, uh, specifically in these situations. So the type masks uh, is is normally worn in in, uh, but all, always in healthcare uh, situations. <clears throat> so that's the basic quality uh, type one is it's maximum the, the filtration needs to be minimum 95 percent there needs to be a certain breathability which means that the the pressure uh, the differential pressure shouldn't be higher than 40. Uh, there is no requirement for splash resistance and they all need to be evenly clean so the microbial cleanliness needs to be less than 30 cfu which means colony forming units, units or the, the measure of number of bacteria uh, should be less than 30 per grams. Uh, the difference for type 2 and type 2 R is that the, the filtration efficiency should even be higher, so 98 minimum 98 percent. 
uh, for type 2, uh, the, the breathability Durability shouldn't be affected by that for two, type 2R as there is an additional protective layer generally on the outside to, to meet the, the requirement for splash resistance needs to be uh, maximum 60 uh, Pascal per square centimeter. So now I give a short overview of the test if individually. Um, as for the FFP mass, you need also to uh, condition these masks prior to testing. In this case, you uh, condition the mask at high humid, uh, at a very in a very humid environment, meaning 80, minimum 85 percent plus or minus five at, at uh, 21 degrees C. Um, so that's basically the simulate conditions of use uh, and the humidity that is creating when you're wearing the mask and when you start breathing uh, through the mask. Um, the first test, so the bacterial filtration efficiency, it's actually described in detail inside the standard, so it's not a separate testing standard uh, for Europe. In the US there is a specific uh, standard for it, it's called the ASTM F2101. It's actually very similar uh, to the one used in Europe. Uh, so what we do is evaluate the effectiveness, effectiveness effectiveness of the mass uh, to capture uh, droplets containing bacteria. So this is the apparatus, so it's a, a high column where we um, create uh, an aerosol uh, starting from a solution containing a certain concentration of a bacteria, in this case the Staphylococcus aureus, and then we uh, underneath that column, we put the sample, so the mask is put uh, above what we call the Anderson impactor. It's actually a sieve system with, with different sizes of, of uh, um, filtration uh, size, uh, starting with the bigger particles uh, uh, to the lower ones. So there are five or six levels, I guess. Uh, so after the what we do is a comparative trial where we use a, uh, no specimen, no sample compared to the, the actual tested uh, mask. Uh, the breathability is called uh, is, is measured by measuring actually the pressure that is needed to pass a certain volume of air through the mask at a certain velocity. Uh, so that's uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, so that's what we call measuring the pressure drop across the mask, and it shouldn't be too high. Uh, so it's uh, the, the opposite of breathability. So all uh, airflow, temperature, and humidity is controlled during the test, and we actually measure um, five different places on, uh, on a mask uh, in one test. And in general, for all these tests, uh, the BFV and the breathability is tested minimum on five different specimens. Then the, the splash resistance uh, is specifically, uh, just to mention, yeah, the breathability is also included as an annex in the, uh, in the actual uh, product standard. Uh, the, ice, the, the splash resistance is, is described in an ISO standard. Uh, so it measures the impact of a small volume of synthetic blood, which is then sprayed at a high velocity at the mask. Um, you can see the test setup more or less here. You see here the syringe where we uh, spray uh, um, the synthetic blood uh, targeted at a very small hole here uh, where uh, it we evaluate the, the possible penetration through the mass. So this is a, a certain speed is, is set uh, and it corresponds actually to puncturing a small blood vessel at a certain uh, vessel pressure, so the, which is uh, 16 kilopascal. Then after uh, the other side, of course, it's a visual evaluation, so we visually evaluate if there is any passage of the red fluid passing through the mask. And then the final 
actual uh, requirement by the standard is the microbial cleanliness or so known as bio burden. It's a very general uh, property actually, which you can analyze on uh, multiple type of uh, products, mainly medical devices, uh, which uh, are used non-sterile or which are sterilized and you have to have a, a limited amount of bio burden or you have to have a high uh, cleanliness to prevent any uh, any contamination even after sterilization. And it's a ISO standard as well, uh, which allows you to determine the total content, content of specifically viable microorganisms uh, which are present on the product. And in this case, microorganisms is broader than just bacteria, so we measure both bacteria and fungi uh, in the, at the same time. So basically for the mask is we we, we submerge it in, in a, what we call an extraction fluid and then we, we give some mechanical action to, to this uh, combination to extract all of the germs which are present on the mask. Uh, then we filter this, uh, we generally filter this, this fluid uh, and we check the, the presence of or, or we count the number of germs present on the, uh, in the fluid which was extracted uh, from the mask. And then finally, the biocompatibility, like I said, it's not the, it's 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 mentioned in the standard, but it's actually a, a requirement for all medical devices which risk to come into contact with the, any part of the body of a of a patient. In this case, of course, it can be coming into contact uh, with the skin. Uh, it's what they call a surface device with limited contact, and so then generally it's uh, required to test. Uh, some biocompatibility properties as mentioned in in the ISO 10993. Uh, it's it's actually a, a very complex um, process generally. It's based on a risk analysis which you have to do. Uh, so but basically uh, generally people are tending to test according to ISO 10993-5 and or uh, dash 10. So dash five is the cytotoxicity, which I briefly mentioned here, where you um, analyze the cellular uh, viability uh, when coming into contact with an extraction fluid uh, taken from the uh, frame, taken from the medical device. In this case, the mask. You can go a step further using uh, uh, irritation or sensitization testing, but as they are mostly done. Uh, still using protocols you, which are using lab animals, yeah, generally uh, a cytotoxicity test uh, is sufficient. So that concludes the, uh, the part on the surgical mask testing. Okay, thank you Mark. And now we will proceed with the presentation on the community mask. So after this session we will have a, a Q&A session. Stain, go ahead. Yep, that's indeed my cue to start my presentation. I have tried to take in control. Let's see if it works. Yeah, perfect. Um, indeed, uh, a third group of masks are the community face coverings or the comfort masks or how we call them in the, in the Dutch language uh, are the mondkapjes. Uh, I already mentioned in the introduction, but again to stress clearly uh, that these masks are not medical or surgical masks, nor are they PPE, so they are not the FFP2 or FFP3 masks. But now that we know what they are not intended for, what is their use or why? how can they be used? Well, they can be used for everybody uh, as a user not displaying any clinical symptoms of viral or bacterial uh, infection and who do not come into contact with people displaying sy systems. So uh, clearly they are not intended for the healthcare industry or for the healthcare sector. Uh, and what do they do? Well, they try to minimize the projectors of the user's droplets or uh, other secretions when they are talking, uh, coughing or sneezing, and they try to prevent any contact to the face with the hands by wearing uh, these masks. Um, when we look into the market uh, and on the streets, uh, with the starting of the whole COVID uh, crisis in March, April, we saw also the first community face mask coming into the image. But if you look at the communication on those masks from the authorities, we can say at least that it was not a very consistent communication on 
where to wear them, how to wear them, what materials can be used, how can you make this, uh, these face masks. So there was a lot of variation and some of that variation was very positive and there were a lot of creative inventions on uh, all kinds of designs which was positive to look at. But if you look at the materials that were used, we were talking about toilet paper, coffee filters, uh, 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 washcloths, uh, so all kinds of materials and to make sure that at least some minimal requirements were defined and at least some uh, restrictions were given to those developments and to those uh, community face masks all kinds of documents were developed uh, across the european uh, union uh, one of the first documents indicating some requirements on these face masks were uh, was in france the afnor document or the afnor specification but then in the, in the month of April, May, we saw that many of the European countries came up with their own standard, with their, not with a standard, but, but with their own document. Also in Belgium, we had the NBN document, the S65. And then somewhere in the end of May, in the beginning of June, also on a European level, a document was created called the CWA17553 document, which was a guide for the minimum requirements trying to summarize or to uh, combine several of the requirements as was stated in each of those separate uh, national documents uh, that we found out. Now for the rest of my talk, I will focus on some of the test requirements as stated in the NBN document, which is on a Belgium level, the, the Belgium Normalization Institute, and then later on also some of those same criteria of also some different criteria as mentioned in the CWA document on a European level. Now, it is very important to state that all these documents, as mentioned in the previous um, uh, slides, are no standards. They are all technical documents, and that also means that all these documents are on a voluntary basis. And although I will only discuss some of the criteria on quality and, and the testing uh, linked to those criteria, um, most of these documents also include some recommendations on size, on the patterns that can be used, but also on the way on how to use it, how to maintain it. Is it washable? How many times can it be washed? What markings, what information should the uh, provider, should the, trans, uh, should the producer uh, uh, give to the market? And also what packaging can be used for those masks. But the focus for today is mainly on the quality requirements and the testing linked to those requirements. Now, if you look in the most of these documents, as well as in the NBN document, we see that they all come back to several testings, several requirements. There is a visual inspection also including in most cases, and this is also the case in the NBN document, the resistance test for the head fastening systems, uh, and then comparable to what we already was discussed in the previous talks on filtering efficiency and air permeability, and also the absence of any harmful chemicals or substances is also uh, mentioned in the NBN document. Now, um, in most of these documents and also in the NBN document is stated that these proofs, these tests can be done in a recognized laboratory, but also in, in house or in, in company uh, testing as long as you can uh, validate the uh, testing and that you can prove the impartiality of the tests done uh, in the own company test facility. Now more specific on the tests, though the first criteria is indeed or the first requirement is the absence of any harmful substances, chemicals. For this you can refer to an existing uh, test system, like for instance the Ecotex certification uh, and test parameters, or you can refer to some several uh, and general known uh, health parameters and check whether these chemicals are present on the mask, yes or no. Concerning some quality aspects, some appearance aspects on the tests uh, of the community masks, we have a visual inspection where we are looking at sharp edges on the quality of the masks, but also on the fit and, and the fitness uh, on how it is presented to the, to the head of the test subject. And also we are looking at the resistance after several wear uh, cycles as well after or before uh, washing cycles of the head securing devices. For the filtering efficiency, I can be very 
short on that because uh, the NBN document is referring to the tests as was already described uh, by the previous two presentations, so referring to the medical masks for the EN14683, but also referring to the FFP masks uh, uh, test method for filtering efficiency to the EN149. Now you have to be aware that the NBN document was created at the end of March and the beginning of April. So that was at the moment that the capacity of testing in Europe was under a big strain and under a big uh, stress moment. So a lot of free capacity was not to be found in European test facilities. And that's <clears throat> the reason why also an alternative um, uh, test methodology was uh, given to, create, to, to check for filtering efficiency, and that was the ISO 16819. Again, for all of these three possible test methods, a clear minimum requirement was stated. Now, it's also very important to mention that one of the big differences between all of those different documents and also a difference between the NBN document on a Belgium level and the CWA document on a European level is what material do we need to test? For instance, for the, N, uh, for the NBA document, it is stated that the filtration efficiency uh, and also the breathability needs to be performed on materials that have undergone a number of washes specified by the manufacturer. So it's up to the producer to state that he wants to have his mask tests after one, five, 10, 20 cycles of washing or what he wants. That's a big difference because when we look in one of the next slides, we will see that for the CWA, the European document, it is stated that the test needs to be done on new material, so before washing and then after washing, in which an additional criteria is given because the minimum number of washing cycles is stated at five for the CWA document. Same story for the air permeability. Again, we are referring to an existing test methodology for the medical face masks. So again, referring to the test methodology in the 14689, uh, sorry, uh, 14683 uh, test standard. Uh, but again, for the same reasons, an, ad an additional alternative test method was given uh, in the ISO 9237, which is a standard uh, textile test for air permeability. So again, giving a, a backup, uh, uh, not using the capacity of testing that was needed for medical uh, face masks at the time of the entering of this document. Now, the same comparison with the CWA document, the European level, which is uh, the final version or the last or the current version is uh, from June 2020. Again, it's not an official standard. It's a CWA, which stands for the SEN Workshop Agreement. And it clearly uh, identifies some minimum criteria, some minimum requirements for a reusable or disposable community face coverings. If you look at the test requirements, or the testing that can be linked to the minimum requirements stated in this document. We see the same parameters popping up again, like in the NBN document, but now also some additional criteria or requirements are asked to the cleaning, to the material itself, to the packaging and so on. For the uh, harmful chemicals and the overall appearance of the community mask, we can see that they are very similar uh, to what we have just mentioned in the N, uh, NBN document. Uh, when we are looking at in other two parameters, the uh, air permeability and the filtration efficiency, we see that the CWA document always is referring to all the other existing documents as mentioned in one of the first slides in my presentation. So they are not giving a list in the document itself, but it refers to an Annex B and C, uh, where again, obviously the same parameter or the same test standards have been mentioned again, uh, like those that were included in the NBN document, but now also including other test possibilities uh, which were mentioned uh, in other standards uh, or in other uh, documents uh, in other national in other uh, national um, documents, as was mentioned in the previous slides. So here also we see a reference to the EN one three two uh, seven four, which is linked to the FFP masks. Uh, breathing resistance, air permeability, same story. We have again a link to the uh, medical mask and the FFP2 mask or FFP category of masks. 
And again, a reference to the ISO 9237 uh, test methodology. Just to give to put your attention on the fact that for those who paid attention to my previous slides, the minimum requirement in the NBN document following the ISO 9237 uh, methodology was 100 liters per second per square meters. Now the minimum requirement is stated uh, to nine, uh, six, uh, uh, 96 liters per second per square meter. As my last slide, just a little uh, reference to one of the first slides by the people from Vito, mentioning that indeed uh, for both uh, the system of medical masks and FFP masks, there's a clear link with certification. This is not a fact for these community masks or these comfort masks. But at the same moment that the first marks appeared in our streets in the period of April uh, and May in Belgium, we had the questions from the industry to have some kind of tool to help them demonstrate that at least their mask, their, uh, their development that they are put that they are putting into the Belgian market fulfills those minimum criteria, especially those on filtration efficiency and air permeability. Centexbel came up with the COVID-19 approved by a Centexbel performance certificate and label. And if I'm correct, I think this is my last slide. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Indeed. So now it's time uh, for some questions and answers on what we've heard uh, regarding the masks, different type of masks. I would like to ask to all the presenters, so Jeroen, Nico, uh, Mark and Steen to put on your uh, camera. Um, yeah. yeah. OK, so. Um, a first question that will probably be for uh, Jeroen, maybe yeah, just for those who entered a little bit uh, um, later. Um, the presentations will be made available for the participants. Um, a first question to uh, Jeroen. Uh, what about the EN136 full face masks? Jeroen or Nico, yeah, depends a little bit who will be answering this because full face mask is probably also FFP related. So are you aware about this standard, the EN136? Yes, uh, uh, Jeroen here. I'm aware about that. Uh, so we have now five groups, but that are all face masks that we are considering at the moment. So if we consider also the full face masks like the 136 here, yeah, we can mention it in mention this in our uh, listing of uh, the five groups and then we make six groups out of this, but we don't do a thing at the moment at Vito for that. Uh, maybe other companies and I think we do not have any plans there. Okay. OK, I hope this uh, solves the question. Um, then about, um, I think it was about the surgical masks, type 2 and 2, 3, uh, 2 R. Um, how long can uh, are the non-conform masks be allowed? Um, so I think it's about uh, the fact that it's not um, not really a certification or so. So I don't know, Mark, if this is uh, something you can uh, respond to? Uh, yes, I just had uh, some contacts with the uh, authorities recently and they are thinking about slowly, I mean this is for the surgical mask, yes, the ATP uh, protocol should slowly be stopped. Mm. So I think they will issue an official announcement, yeah, whoever reaches this, I don't know, but they will probably also do that on their website, of course, where all the information currently is present. So I don't think that's something that will continue for much longer, honestly. Uh, by the way, we don't get, um, yeah, late, uh, the last couple of months even, we, we didn't see much uh, activity on that area anyway. So mm -hmm. I think that's something that should be slowly forgotten, let's say. Yeah. Uh, for the moment. This also means that the stress on the testing labs is less now compared to some time ago or not yet? Because I think that was developed especially to reduce a little bit a large number of uh, testing. Uh, of tests. That's, that's or could that's be how one we of the reasons, but it's <laughs> not the reason why we presented the, I, they, the, the basic reason why is just to uh, alleviate the shortage because if there would 
be stopping millions basically of masks at the border mm -hmm. for administrative reasons uh, that would not be uh, uh, accepted very well by the general public and the hospitals who were actually crying or uh, asking for a mask uh, at the start of the crisis. So that's basically why it was done. But uh, for the moment, of course, now everybody should know the actual rules uh, of importing these masks and that you, what, what kind of documents are needed and so on. So uh, it was an exceptional rule and that's why it will probably be, be stopped. And what concerning the pressure on the labs, yes, we have uh, increased our capacity uh, and of course the, the number of, of requests is, is uh, reducing. So yes, we are back to, let's say, reasonable lead times at the moment. Yes, mm. I think that's the case for also not to mention that there are like Vito, another, a number of other uh, laboratories took initiatives to uh, uh, to install this expertise uh, at them. So if we were one of the few in the world uh, before this crisis, now there are many, many more labs offering these tests at the moment mm -hmm. everywhere anyway, which is not always a good thing, but yeah, they are. Okay, <laughs> thank okay. you. Yeah. So, Jeroen, you also mentioned in your uh, overview that uh, often there is some functionality that they add, like antiviral uh, properties. So, the question is, what if the antiviral product they are using is a non-biocide? Yes, uh, I have not the right answer for that. Let's be clear. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the time, you should say antiviral is a biocide. Mm -hmm. But I have no exceptions in mind to think about this. So yeah. not clear for me at the moment. Okay, I don't know if somebody else from the panel could uh, could uh, yeah give uh, some additional answer on that or there's no what about a non biocide antiviral? Maybe so just briefly if stating antiviral is already in the sense of definition of a biocide. So you just need to call it differently. Uh, you need to be creative if you want to avoid being uh, eligible to to uh, follow the biocidal legislation. So it's a very thin line you're working on if you're doing that. So be careful. That's all my <laughs> my advice. OK, yeah. Then there was a question to Nico about um, the measurements you do for the fit, where it's asked, uh, do you provide anthrometri anthrometric measurements of the test persons in this still test? Yeah. Yeah, that's something that we indeed do. The EN149 is fairly general in its recommendation. They just say you need to have suitable persons that are typical of the of the of the people that are using them uh, and doesn't specify any further that what we did is we, we looked further on onto an ISO an ISO standard so the ISO I'm just reading it now eh? the ISO 16970 uh, 76 part mm -hmm. 2 uh, and it's an ISO standard describing anthropometrics and how you can divide a whole group both men and female and, and women uh, into 10 groups of people based on their face length face width and so on so we looked at uh, we, we added that to our internal procedure so we we know that we have a suitable range uh, people with small heads, with big heads, broad heads, uh, to, to test them. And what we do need to do in the EN149 is specify what kind of characteristics the test panel have. So the test panel results, the measurements of our test panel, they are in our test report and can be checked. So there's also a reference made here in the chat to the P5, P50 and P95 size distribution. Is that something you're also using? Well, there, there, there is, as mentioned, the based on on the the statistics, there is there is uh, an uh, an X and a Y diagram uh, on on based on specific measurements that you then position them. It's not so strictly as P95 or P99. It's more of a block uh, diagram, uh, but uh, it has statistics behind them. But they are, they are not similar to the P95 or so. Thing. But it's it's yeah it is a specific ISO standard that's focused on anthropometrics uh, that we follow. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
thank you. And then I see a question for Mark. Um, are there at this moment reusable fabrics known that pass the EN 14,683? Uh, very good question. Um, it's a, actually a very big minority of, of samples that we that we get tested. There were more at the start of the crisis because yeah, everybody started at the moment. Um, but I, the most most of the new manufacturers which we are uh, getting samples from are basing uh, based on the traditional materials uh, which are already been used in the past. There might be, but I'm not honestly. I'm not really aware mm -hmm. about it. We don't. We didn't also compile all this information yet. Probably that's part of the of the, of this project as well. So. Please participate and you will learn uh, probably how you can do that uh, in the future. Thank you. OK, another question about the biocidal, virucidal, as we just uh, mentioned it. So there's a new question uh, stating that what is the product? What if the product is daily used in the food industry? You eat it on a daily basis. So um, what about that? I cannot and comment on. Effect, a, I yeah. cannot honestly comment on a specific mm. case if I don't have yeah. all the details. So yeah. it's very difficult. I just gave the general information. If you call mm. something antiviral, it probably needs to comply with some kind of legislation. Yeah. If it's yeah. the food industry that accepted it, it's a different kind of application. Yeah. So it's not always right. the same rules are valid for a different application. Mm. That's not the case. Uh, all the risks that you have when putting in food or on a body or in a, using it on a patient, it's not the same risk. Mm -hmm. So you need to evaluate every case by case. That's all yeah. I can say for the moment. Thank you. Yeah, I can yeah. add maybe a little a little thing. Uh, we at Santex Bell had a project on uh, biocidal uh, products uh, because yes, this is quite difficult for textiles to put uh, uh, biocidal products onto it. At least there's, uh, uh, let's say, a heavy uh, regulation about it. And we also thought at that time we will we will look what is used in food industry and in cosmetics and use it on our textiles because that should be normally feasible if you can eat it if you can put it on your face why wouldn't you be able to put it on textiles but no this was not the case so they look at the application to say what's possible or not and it might seem a little bit uh, strange but that's the fact we also learned in the in that product in that project so uh, if you would need uh, some more information on that i can see if one of the colleagues can uh, give you some more information on on that but so it's not so easy to say it's used in another industry it may be used there so it should be also usable in textiles unfortunately that's not so straightforward so as far as i see yeah but i can and come comment on that because you definitely need to watch out because uh, things that you eat they go into the digestive tract Mm -hmm. uh, while things that you put on a mask, you do and you have inhalation. So things might be dangerous to your lungs while they are not dangerous to my stomach. Uh, just yeah. very uh, plastically yeah. mentioned. Yeah, uh, yeah. So and they do I not would own. Not mm -hmm. I would not mention. I would not put those things in the same basket. No, yeah, and they do not only look to the human, but also to the environment. Uh, uh, what's happening afterwards with it, if it's coming uh, in the environment or not. OK, so I think this concludes a little bit the parts. Um, OK, I just see something uh, popping up about FFPs and the KN95 masks. There is a disagreement on the ATP testing for FFP2 and KN95 masks. Sometimes the port count is used to measure the filter efficiency while the supplier of the device recognized that this device is not suitable for the tests. Some labs also have a post against this ATP testing. Are we sure that it will not reject masks that are actually good? Nico, did you understand the question? Yes, it's okay. quite complex. Now, I think there most likely are people in the audience that are more familiar with the ATP. Uh, but as I see it, uh, the well, actually the ATP sometimes uh, is supposed to be a little bit more flexible. So you would expect, I, I answered the last question first. Uh, does it, will it reject masks that might be good? Well, the general idea of the different labs that are involved with the ATP 
that especially those that that are involved with designing the ETP is they look up about it differently is that the 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 EN is more strict and severe than the ATP so it might even be possible that the ETP leaves mask true that might be rejected by the EN49 uh, and not the other way around. Um, mentioning that the, the port account is not uh, designed for that testing, that's also true. Uh, but as, as Mike also mentioned uh, in the beginning of the crisis, uh, we, uh, Belgium had to do with the things that we did and uh, especially those labs that were involved uh, with designing the ETP, which we weren't, uh, just to be honest. Um, they, they used instruments that were suitable and they modified protocols to be able to do these things quite creatively. Uh, so I think that with, with all the possibility and all the knowledge that that um, we had then, uh, that yeah, you have to be, you can say, well, they did a good job. Uh, but of course, it's, it isn't a full standard. Uh, but uh, but based on the on the circumstances, uh, the things that that were done then were definitely defendable. Yeah. I think you need to put it in perspective that at that time that was what we had and we needed to do something and to have some test methods. So, uh, uh, and as Mark says, also the ATP will disappear once that we notice that we have uh, enough capacity um, for testing it with the real standards that were made for it. Okay, thank you for this panel uh, with the experts on the typical uh, on the different masks. We will continue with the next presentation, which will be uh, presented by Ina on materials that are used uh, for these FFP and um, medical masks. So Ina, if you can upload the presentation, yes. So that's yeah. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Miriam. So I will go a little bit more into detail on the materials used for the medical and the FFP masks. So we have the two types, medical and FFP. I will go more into detail on the medical first. Um, this is just a small recap of what Mark already presented. So the other requirements for the medical masks. Um, so we have the bacterial filtration efficiency, which is quite imp important, the differential pressure and the um, splash resistance. Um, so what we did at Centex Bell, we actually um, took eight different medical masks. So we selected them randomly and then we um, investigated them. So we looked at them via microscope. So to see how they were composed, the composition, the buildup of the materials. We looked at the weight and the thicknesses of the layers, looked at their bacterial filter efficiency, also the differential pressure and the air permeability. Um, so if we can summarize everything, of the eight masks, we had six masks which had the first uh, build-up. So it is a polyprop spun bonded non-woven. As middle layer, we have a polyprop melt blown non-woven and a polyprop spun bond non-woven. So you can see also the cross section of the mask. One mask actually was composed of four layers, one polyprop spun bonded non-woven on the outside, two melt blown non-woven as middle layers and a polyprop spun bond as outer layer. So this will be referred later on in the presentation as mask number four. And we also had one mask which was composed actually out of three spun bonded non-woven layers. And this will be referred to later on as mask number one. Um, so if we take a look at a different mask via microscope, actually we can always see quite similar um, images. So this is how the polyprop spun bonded looks like. Then we have a polyprop melt blown in the middle and then a polyprop spun bound on the outside. So as you can see here already from the pictures that actually this melt blown non woven is much more dense than the spun bonded ones. So that means that this melt blown layer actually determines the filter efficiency of the mask. Um, on the other hand, this melt blown layer is very fragile, so it actually needs protection uh, from abrasion, etc. And that's why it's incorporated between two spun bonded uh, non wovens. Um, and as you can see, actually, on this picture, these different fibers of the spun bonded non wovens are actually bound together via dot calendaring. So you see these patterns where the different fibers are molten together to get the strength of the material. 
Um, if you take a look at the weight at the thickness of the melt blown layer, so the middle layer, what we can see is actually that it varies between 21, let's say on average, and 27. Um, for one and for two is actually uh, the first and the second melt blown layer of the four layered mask. Um, and if you see at the layer thickness, then it varies between, let's say, 0 0.18 and 0 0.27 millimeters. Um, what we can actually see is there are no clear relations between the weight and the thickness. This is also because also you have the density dependency because not all uh, melt blown layers are as dense, uh, equally dense. So that's why there's no clear relation. If you look at the bacterial filter efficiency, according to the EN14683, um, so we have the two types. Um, lim type 1 has a limit of 95% and type 2 and 2R has a limit of 98%. If you look at our analysis, then we can actually see that, for example, this one using the spun bonded layer, it's actually very below um, the limit. So you need to have 95 and we're not even reaching 60. Um, so here you can see actually that the use of a melt bone layer is quite a necessity to have a good filtration efficiency. But even though other masks are composed of these melt bone layers, in some cases they also do not meet the requirements. And what we can also say is, for example, mask number four has the two melt bone layers um, that actually the efficiency is even lower, a little bit lower than some of the masks which were composed out of only one middle layer. So there's no need to use two melt blown layers. One can be already sufficient. If we look at the bacterial filter efficiency versus the weight of the melt blown <coughs> layer, and we can actually see that and if you have a weight of 25 grams per square meter, above this weight actually you have quite good filter efficiency. So that's why we can use actually this 25 grams per square meter as some kind of guidance. If you have to select different non-wovens, maybe it's better to go for one above 25 grams that you have a higher security that it will meet the bacterial filter efficiency. Um, then we take a look at the differential pressure. Of course, the spun bonded ones, there are more open structures compared to the melt blown, so you have a much better differential pressure. It's very low, so that's very good. Um, but of course, it does not meet the filter efficiency. Um, what we can also see is um, that there's also a huge variety. For example, the one with the two layers, um, the differential pressure is not that different than, for example, one with only one layer. And for example, this one, the number eight, which actually has only one melt blown layer, but it has a very high differential pressure. So that above this limit of 60. So that means it does not meet the requirements. Um, it will be very difficult actually to breathe in this one. Um, we also uh, assessed the air permeability according to the ISO 9237. Um, it has to be mentioned this standard is not part of the EN14683 for the medical mask, but we just wanted to see what the correlation was between uh, the DP and the air permeability. Um, so what you can see, of course, these spun bonded ones are much more breathable than the melt blown layers, as you can see here. Um, we always assessed with 100 pascal and 200 pascal, that's why the two colors. Um, um, what we can also see is, for example, of course, the higher the pressure, the more um, permeable the material is. Um, and actually, what we wanted to do is then um, plot the differential pressure versus the air permeability. For example, if you would have a fabric in house where you know the air permeability, but you don't know the DP via this equation, you can try to have an idea of the DP value of the fabric. It will help you a little bit in selection. So what we can see as a guidelines that actually the melt blown layer is necessary for the filter efficiency. Um, this melt blown layer, of course, needs to be protected, and this can be done by the spun bonded, which is very uh, used nowadays. Um, then in many cases that one middle layer is sufficient um, if you aim for a melt blown layer with a weight of 25 grams per square meter or higher. 
But we can also see that all the mouth masks are actually assembled via confectioning. So the, I'm meaning that not all the different layers within the mask are actually glued together, but they're just confectioning together. Um, but we still have to say that testing is always needed due to the variation in the melt blown layers. So it's not because you're using this 25 grams per square meter that it will um, meet all the requirements. So it really has to be tested case by case. So then if we take a look at the FFP masks, um, here we only assessed three different masks. Um, so we also looked via microscope. We looked at the composition of the masks, also their weight of the different layers and the air permeability. Um, so we have three, we assessed three ones in FFP2, an FFP3 and the Chinese version, a KN95. Um, so the FFP2 was actually composed out of four different layers. Um, an outer layer, a polyprop spawn bonded one. Then you have here two quite similar polyprop melt blown layers and we have a polyester spawn bonded layer. If you look at the FFP3, there are actually six different layers. We have on top the polyprop spawn bonded one. Then we have a set of two polyprop uh, melblones. Again, a set of two polyprop melblones and a polyester spawn bond. And if you look at the KN95, this one is composed of four different layers. So again, a polyprop spawn bond on the outside. But then, then again, a polyprop spawn bond, a polyprop melt blown, and again, a polyprop spawn bond. So this is actually a monomaterial mask, only polyprop. If you look at the images, they're actually quite comparable to what we see in the medical mask. So um, here the spawn bonded with the more dense melt blown middle layers and the inner layer is also a uh, spawn bond. For example, here you can clearly see that this inner layer is much more dense uh, than this outer layer. Here they're more similar, so it really depends on the type of fabric. If we look at the KN95 also, here we had the three spawn bonded ones and the melt blown layer also in between. Um, here you can also see, for example, there's difference in density of this spawn bond non-woven on the outside and the one on the inside. This is also reflected in the average weight of the different layers. Uh, for example, as you can see here, this um, Chinese one has a very high weight um, layer one. So this is thick one. And also if you see here, this is this quite dense one. Um, but the variation is many of the layers are actually varying between 21 and 30 for the melt blown ones. And then the spun bond can be higher in weight like this 44. This is a bit lower. This is also what we see in the microscopic picture that this one was more dense than that one. Um, also here the layers of the melt blown here in between these four are between 20 and 30 grams per square meter. We also take a look at the air permeability according to the ISO 9237. This is also a testing which is actually not part of the EN149, um, but we just wanted to evaluate it and see the results. Um, and as you can see, for example, that this uh, Chinese KN95 is much more breathable uh, than the FFP2. And FFP3 is the less breathable. Of course, this one offers the most protection, so it will have the higher filter efficiency, which mostly correlates to a lower air permeability. And we can also nicely see when we double the pressure that also the air permeability doubles nicely. Um, so we are still continuing this part, so uh, we will gather more information on the FFP masks um, and then we also do a study on materials for the community masks. Um, so far no results are obtained yet, but they're in our lab and we will hope next time that we will also give you can give you more information on the materials for the community masks. So this is the acknowledgement and maybe again also from Santex Bell's side. Um, the contact details, so if it can deals with uh, medical masks, you can best contact Mart Cruz for the testing of the community masks or either Stein who presented or Lise Albor, the head of our physical lab, can help you with that. And if you have more questions on the material use, you can always contact me. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Ine. Um, there's one question for you with respect to the FFP marks. If you checked if the middle layers are electrostatically charged. No, we did not do that okay. so far. Maybe that's a suggestion yeah. just to look at we uh, that when we do took... account. Yeah. Okay. So, so far, I don't see any additional questions. Um, oh, there's one. What about shelf life? Uh, moisture, does moisture affect the performance? And how should you deal with that? Do we have an idea about that? I think as most are composed out of polyprop, this is a material that is less prone to moisture absorption. So I think there it will be less affected. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we didn't do any research on that topic, but yeah. it, the materials are not known to be very hydrophilic. Yeah. But there were also but, some the FFPs with polyester, of course, instead yes, of polypropylene. Yeah. So there might be... Yeah. Yeah, this is something we did not take into account yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe from Vito's side, from the testing side, if they have more information on this. Well, yes, but not really on the shelf life. I think the, the question can be divided in two parts. Uh, moisture can affect performance. Uh, on a short term, uh, that's evaluated in the test. Uh, as with, uh, I mentioned in the conditioning, we do simulated wearing in which we expose the mask to, to a certain breathing uh, rhythm with, with moist, humid air. Uh, so the performance on a short term, uh, uh, when we test it, uh, it's done with, uh, with a moistened mask. So their short term performance is evaluated. Uh, what we do not do uh, is an evaluation after two years of shelf life, for example, one typical shelf life of FFP mask is two to three years, which needs to be st stipulated by the producer. Uh, so that's not standard uh, things that, that, that are tested. Yeah. yeah, so that was also then the remark that I saw uh, coming. Do you have to repeat all the EN testing at the end of the shelf life? because it's indeed on a new mask, it's tested, but it's never tested during the life. Uh, as you also have a test, for instance, for clogging, I can imagine that this clogging during the lifetime of the mask could yeah, increase that uh, you indeed get some clogging uh, after a while. Yeah. While using. That's, that's a correct question. That is a good question, but it's not it's answered not with, standard. Uh, yeah. with, with standard testing. Okay. Uh, what okay. you could maybe do is do some accelerated aging of the masks and then try to redo the testing again. Um, mm -hmm. Something we can think about. Perhaps already adding to the, the, the question on the electrostatic charges on, on middle layers is not my specialty, uh, but we have been asked the same question, um, but as I'm aware, but I'm definitely not a specialist, is that it's not fair, it's not actually simple to measure only the inside layer of uh, a mask uh, on electrostatic charges. You can either, you can measure, of course, the individual layers, but that does not mean it's as relevant when they combine them with different layers. So actually, in, in, in uh, to be able to have a realistic view, uh, you measure the electrostatic properties of the whole mask all different all different layers combined uh, and when you when you take them apart eh, you can indeed then measure it but it's no longer valid because if you if you combine the results for example of a three-layered mask it does not mean that you can just add on eh? so it's it the, the different components combined is not the same as measuring a complete mask so it seems fairly difficult to to do that kind of measurement but especially i'm not a specialist Oh, okay, yeah, thank you for uh, your presentation, Ine, and also Nico for uh, uh, resp responding to the questions. Um, now we go to the last part of the uh, the webinar, which is uh, which deals more with the uh, uh, fit. So I would like to ask Joris to um, to share his presentation. Yes, good um, morning or good afternoon almost. Uh, 
everybody. Um, just want to share my presentation. I hope it's visible for yep. everybody. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Here we go. Um, this presentation, I will try to give you some uh, insights on the anthropometric parameters for the design of uh, face masks. Um, these days, several different uh, community face masks are available uh, for sale, and many different patterns can be downloaded through the internet uh, to make your own mask. Uh, the comfort of and the fit of these masks are not always very satisfactory. Um, major reason for this is a lack of uh, head and face measuring tables. Uh, the fit is uh, age related, uh, might be gender related, and the ethical origin uh, plays also a very important role. Um, to, to find the right size for the uh, face mask, uh, we first need to understand which face and head measurements are uh, to be taken into account. Uh, the human face and uh, head have tens of different uh, landmarks. In uh, literature, we found uh, about 50 landmarks which might be useful for the design of uh, face and half face uh, masks. Um, and respirators, of course, uh, also artisanal mas uh, masks, community masks, and surgery masks. Uh, the most important uh, landmarks are marked here on the head, um, on this slide. Uh, when putting a half mask on the, on the head form, uh, we have a clear view on which uh, 20 landmarks will be uh, useful uh, for this type of uh, mask. Uh, we have uh, the top of the nose, the tip of the nose, the point under the nose, um, the bottom of the chin, the Adam's apple, the nose roots, uh, nose roots uh, at the top, the nose wings, uh, lip corners, the jaw bones, uh, the ears, the brow ridges, and the back of the head. Uh, these landmarks are um, needed uh, for measuring the head uh, and the face in a proper and uniform way. Uh, so the um, uh, measurements we found uh, to be uh, useful, uh, we, we found about uh, 14 measurements uh, for the design of the head mask, of the, of the face mask, uh, sorry. Um, we need uh, for the face, we need the, the length, uh, this one, uh, the forehead uh, width, uh, the jaw width here, and um, the lip length. Uh, for the nose, we have the width, um, at the wings, at the roots, um, the length and the protrusion. Uh, the chin is interesting for masks um, with an inset chin piece. Uh, the chin art, it's uh, this measurement or here. Um, and the nose arc can be important for single um, panel patterns. Uh, the head guard and the neck uh, guard might be interesting measurements uh, for the head attachments. Um, as it's not possible in this project uh, to organi organize a massive size survey uh, to collect all this data, uh, we checked what's already uh, available on the, in, the, in the literature. And we found about 10 studios, which might be interesting uh, with a total of um, 11,600 um, uh, subjects um, where the heads and the faces were measured. Um, here, the, the first seven are for uh, adults and the last three for children. Uh, the measurement table in uh, ISO TS uh, 169762 uh, is based on the study of Brad Miller and Fries. So um, this uh, the first uh, study. Um, 
and it will study for the National Institute for Occupational uh, Safety and Health in the uh, United States. Uh, the NBN docu documents, um, but also uh, the AFNOR, um, uh, sorry, the NBN document S65001, the AFNOR document S76001, and the European document uh, CWA17553. Uh, they all refer to the measurements uh, mentioned in the ISO DS 16794. Um, thus also uh, to the study of Brett Miller and uh, Fries. But this need to be updated because uh, it mentioned only the 89th uh, percentiles. Um, as stated before, uh, the fit is age related. Uh, gender related uh, and et ethnical origin is also important. Uh, in this, these papers, uh, we have a very good mix of all male and female uh, subjects, children and people with different ethical origin. Uh, the Indian people were left out of the stu study because uh, the sample is too small. Uh, the 11,600 subjects uh, have different uh, 30 uh, different nationalities uh, from all over the world. Uh, to understand the differences between the adult males uh, and females uh, of different ethnic origins, we check the means uh, of all the measurements. Uh, for the head guard, uh, the difference um, between the minimum and the maximum is uh, 12 millimeters. Uh, for the face, we see a difference of maximum seven millimeter. Uh, for the face width, uh, uh, I mean, and for the face length and lower face length, uh, a maximum difference is respectively uh, three and five millimeters. For the nose, we see maximum differences as follows: uh, eight millimeter in the width uh, at the bottom of the nose, and uh, less than two millimeters uh, at the top of the nose. Uh, we have also less than four millimeters uh, difference in the length and 1.5 millimeters in, in the prominence of the nose. Uh, the lip length uh, differs maximum uh, five millimeters and the nose arc um, nine millimeters. Uh, we see only big, uh, quite big uh, differences in the jaw width, uh, which is 14 to 16 millimeters, and in the chin arc, uh, which is more than 20 millimeters. Uh, what's our conclusion here? Um, we see a minimal, uh, minimal uh, differences in the means of the head uh, and the face measurements uh, between different ethical origins. But uh, it's quite obvious that uh, the head and the face morphology is different uh, between these uh, origins. Uh, we can use all the exist existing data uh, to make uh, measurement tables. Uh, so the next step will be um, uh, to make five different uh, measurement tables, one for each origin and one mixed. Uh, we will compare them uh, to find out if one table will be sufficient uh, or maybe we need to split up into uh, different measurement tables. Uh, the next step is to compare the male and the female uh, measurements to see if the head and the face proportions uh, differ from each other. Uh, we compared here the head guard, the face length, the lower face length, uh, the face width, the jaw width, the chin arc and the nose arc. Uh, the green line, uh, so the, the inner line here, uh, these are the female measurements and the um, uh, orange line uh, are the male measurements. We see here that the proportions are nearly the same for both genders. So what's uh, our conclusion here? We see uh, minor differences in, proportion, in, in proportions uh, between male and female uh, heads and face. Um, and the next step will be um, to find out how many different sizes will be needed. Uh, so uh, small, medium, large, do we, do we need uh, smaller sizes or, or uh, uh, larger sizes? 
this will be investigated uh, in the next uh, one or two months. Uh, so we can use the same measurement table for both uh, genders, for male and female, which will be a unisex size table. Uh, for the site uh, designation, uh, it's important to find out uh, which head or face measurement can be used as a primary um, dimension. Uh, most head and face measurements are very um, difficult to measure because uh, a caliper or a head scanner uh, is to be used. Um, the most um, easy um, measurement uh, to, to measure uh, is the head circumference or the, the head girth uh, because it can be measured with a simple uh, measure, uh, measure tape or measurement tape. Um, we compared um, the face length, uh, face width, uh, the jaw width, the chin arc and the nose arc uh, in correlation uh, with the head girth. And we see uh, that the face length and the face width um, have a high cor correlation uh, with the head curves. Um, here we can conclude that uh, if we make a measurement table in a size of small, medium, large, or uh, smaller or bigger, each size will be uh, designated uh, to a range of head curves. Uh, the next step is to find out how many sites will be needed, as stated in uh, my previous uh, uh, conclusion. Um, we have a large database of uh, head curves of the Belgian population, which is called in uh, 2012, 2014, and this may help us to, uh, to find uh, the size range. Now for children. Um, we check the correlation between the age and the face length and the width. Uh, and for both measurements, we see an excellent uh, correlation. Um, so we can uh, use for this uh, uh, measurement table for children uh, the age as a primary parameter. Uh, it can be the head girth, but I think the age should also be um, sufficient and the next step is to find out how many sizes uh, will be needed uh, can we combine some a, a couple of ages in one size or do we have to uh, make a measurement table per um, uh, year um, Another part of our study uh, is um, to, um, to make different um, kinds of uh, community face masks. Uh, we did already a selection. We gathered about uh, 20 different uh, community masks and made our selection uh, based on uh, what uh, we think uh, would be uh, the best solution. Uh, the first... Um, Mask type uh, is uh, in two layers with a pleat in the front uh, here and uh, a press pleat, I mean, and um, a dart on the, on the nose and under the chin. A second mask, uh, also uh, probably two layered uh, with a dart on the nose and an inset uh, piece, uh, chin piece uh, here under the chin, of course. Um, a third mask we selected is in um, uh, one or two layers. It probably is uh, two layers in, uh, in a knitted fabric uh, with an elastic ribbon uh, on the top and uh, under the chin. A uh, fourth mask, will, uh, which will be uh, prototyped um, is um, a mask in uh, cut in one piece with uh, um, in, uh, yeah, uh, ear attachments uh, included in the cut pattern. Um, it's a fabric which is two or three layers uh, laminated to each other uh, with a dart 
on the nose and a dart uh, under the chin. Uh, the fifth one is uh, something completely new uh, developed uh, at Hoogend. Uh, it's a mask uh, probably consisting in uh, two layers with an inset nose piece and an inset uh, chin piece. And uh, the last um, selection is uh, also a mask with uh, two layers uh, and with pleats. So this is it uh, from my part. Um, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Oris. So it's quite obvious that there are different measurements and that an, uh, one fits all is probably not feasible. That's I would not like feasible to indeed. yeah, I would like to continue with the presentation of Ilse, who will uh, talk more about the dilemma on the fit. Go ahead, Ilse. So also the questions for Yuris will follow after the presentation of uh, Ilse. I assume I'm visible at this moment. It's OK. Yep. OK, thank you. And yes, I will go more into detail on uh, the fit and the comfort test that we will perform in uh, the framework of the project. So the problem with a community mask is that it often doesn't fit as it should fit. Uh, I'm not going uh, into detail on uh, the comparison between chirurgical and community mask because all previous speakers already gave a big overview of what is uh, the difference between a chirurgical and a community mask. But perhaps uh, one uh, similarity also for chirurgical masks, often the fit isn't appropriate as it should be. So we can uh, divide our comfort masks into three types. If we see what's uh, on the market available at this moment, we see that we have uh, what we call community masks and community masks are made in serial production and they also have a proven uh, performance by scientific testing. For those masks, we have uh, the two documents which can be applied, the NBN and the CWA. Uh, which is uh, also applicable for this type of mark masks. Then we also have uh, comfort masks which are on the market. Uh, they are mainly produced in fashion. They are made by serial production, but performance is not at all proven. We see here four masks worn by female, and as you see, the third mask is not protective at all. It's just uh, a net, so it doesn't give any protection. Protection. And then a third type of masks are the artisanal masks. They are made at home. It are the do-it-yourselves. And performance is not proven. And even in material choices, we can have uh, serious questions because it might be that the material is already uh, uh, contaminated by, for example, bacteria or fungi, fungi, or that, for example, some products which are hazards for the health can be released out of the masks. But when is a mask a community mask? A mask is a community mask when it covers from uh, the nose bridge over the nose to the mouth and then to the chin, and then it should also cover correctly the cheeks. So when is it fitting or not fitting? It should really fully cover nose, mouth and chin and fits snugly against the sides of the face. I have here a, a photo of a, a male mannequin wearing a uh, community mask, a disposable. And as you can see, the fit is not at all correct. Uh, if you look at the nose, then uh, you see that there is a gap there. Just probably there will be fogging if uh, the mannequin would wear, for example, glasses. 
and if not anyway the eyes will be dried out also at the cheeks there is uh, a gap so this is not convenient at all and then at the chin there is also a leak when there is leakage there is always less performance of the mask so this should be avoided anyway by a correct fitting and the right pattern also behind the ears we can have several problems because if uh, it is uh, too uh, tight, it can cause injuries in the skin of the ears. Then I have also a photograph of a girl wearing a chirurgical mask and glasses. And as you see at the cheeks, it isn't tight enough neither. For the glasses, it is all right. They aren't fogging on because there is a bandable bridge to adjust to the form of her face. Even uh, if you wear a, a good fitting mask, when you start moving, it should also keep its position when you move your head. And then it should be very easy to put it on and to take it off again. And it may not cause any difficulty while breathing. So if you wear a mask, you should get used to wearing a mask because in comparison with no mask, breathability is always a little bit lower. So there are some... Uh, effects of in, an inconvenient fit of the mask or inappropriate gabardachery, such as headache. So uh, a mask can be worn or by uh, the ears or over the head. And if it is too tight, it can cause headache. It can cause incisions in the skin be behind the ears. Even uh, elastics or cord stoppers can stick into long hair, for example, or for female, uh, the elastics or the ribbons can even uh, stick into earrings. So this is not uh, convenient at all. This gives a discomfort. Often masks also give fogging of glasses and drying out of eyes and then uh, uh, combination of fit and material is deposits of moisture inside uh, the mask as well. So within uh, the campaign that we started, the test and comfort test campaign, we focus on uh, two items. We focus on the user and then on the mask itself. For the user, we look at morphology of uh, different faces and heads and we make size tables. And then we select a test panel, which is representative for Belgian population. For the mask, we focus on correct fit and different styles. At the moment, we have six uh, different mask styles that we will use, and we will also focus on different barrier layers. They can be single, they can be double, and they can eventually be combined with filter material. And then we will also focus on, on different gabardachery. So, for example, uh, uh, the putting on can be adjustable or non-adjustable. We will work with bandable wires, with um, a nose bridge. We can wear, work with elastics or non-elastic ribbons. And we can uh, put the masks on and uh, use uh, a hat uh, uh, closure or we can use it behind the ears. If we look more into detail, on the morphology of the face and the head, we had uh, quite some information from my colleague Joris, but I will uh, give a quick uh, summary. Uh, so uh, the head dimensions and the face dimensions are uh, in the first place age related. We all know the baby face, a round face with a lot of fat under the skin. If we go older, the fat uh, under the skin tends to disappear uh, very uh, quietly. For an adult, uh, if we look at an adult skeleton and we look over a lifetime, then a skeleton tends to grow about 10% over a lifetime. So even if you're an adult, your head dimensions and face dimensions aren't constant. They always change a little bit. Then there are also some gender related items. For example, male have the tendency to have a, a, a more square face and pronounced cheeks and nose, where a female has more around face. And then we have also some uh, 
ethnical related influences. I have here uh, three photos uh, or uh, six photos uh, of women, which I also took from the internet. It's an European type and an Asian type and at the right an African type. And if we look at the photo of the side, we see clearly that the nose of a European woman is much more pronounced, whereas an Asian type has more a flatter face and an African type has a pronounced chin. So it's really necessary to have uh, good size tables, to have the right patterns adopted to the face and head dimensions. For the barrier layer, we look at some essential requirements such as filtration efficiency and air permeability. We also want to be harmless to the skin and doesn't release hazards or nuisance products that can be inhaled. But we will also make a, make a selection to offer more comfort for the user. For example, we will uh, focus on the handle. We have in our lab a specialist test panel, which was selected over uh, our personal bin in ho hand. And this is a test with YPV domes and it looks at finger sensibility. And with the test, we uh, selected five women and five uh, men over different age, ages with very sensible fingers so that they really can feel quite um, small differences in, for example, smoothness or roughness of a fabric. They can feel uh, whether a fabric feels cold or more warm. So we will uh, select uh, some uh, barrier layers which are more soft to the skin. We will also use the fabric touch tester which uh, gives an insight in surface properties, in bending properties and also in thermal properties of a fabric. And then we will also perform management, moisture management test. And in the moisture management test, we want to have an indication of what happens when saliva comes into contact with the barrier layer. Will it stay there or will it pass through the barrier layer, for example? Because uh, in between the skin and uh, the lips and then uh, the barrier layer, you have a microclimate. And if it becomes too hot inside, this is this. Uh, comfortable. So we want to test this as well. Then we will look at some physic additional physical preferences such as shrinkage and skew because a masker can fit at the beginning but after cleaning cycles five times, ten times, twenty times it might be that due to the skewness in a fabric the mask doesn't fit anymore. So it should be dimensional stable during its complete life time. We will also focus on head harness and gabardashery. So we will use different nose bridges, different sizes, uh, different sharpnesses. Uh, it might, for example, occur that we have a certain nose bridge which is too sharp and that during cleaning the nose bridge comes through the fabric, which is not recommendable. We will also test different materials, for example, metal and then also thermoplastical materials and different dimensions. We will uh, also use cord stoppers and then we will also test size and design. For example, if you put uh, an air uh, a cord stopper behind the ear, it might be that it is too large and that it is discomfortable as well. Then we will also look into different ribbon constructions with elasticity, for example, cords or perhaps knitted or woven fabric. Uh, as we see here uh, on uh, the photographs, uh, I have here uh, a mask that's worn behind the ears. Then another one, uh, which is a do-it-yourself mask where they adapted uh, the fit by using extras. And then we have a third mask on uh, the male mannequin. And we see that one of uh, the black ribbons, uh, elastic ribbons, just um, isn't uh, tight enough, so it can be worn uh, over the hat, uh, higher on the hat, or it can be tightened with a cord stopper. So there are different possibilities uh, to use the gabardashery in a correct way and in a comfortable way. 
For the setup of uh, the FIT test, we will uh, also test uh, select a test panel. If we look at Belgian population, we see that about 51% is female and 49% is male, and about 12% has another origin. 65 uh, years and older are about 90%, and then 61% has an age between 18 and 64. So we will uh, use with a disproportional and test and probability sampling because it's not possible uh, to select the test panel in a proportional way. We have to work disproportional and it will be by prob probability sampling. We want to concentrate on people with different activity levels, for example, teachers. Uh, teachers have to speak a lot, so they you have to use their voice Voice, it might be that the mask gives a discomfort in using the voice and that they have to raise their voice. So this is an important group to test. Then we will select some people working just in the office. They are quite non-active physically. Then we will also test, uh, for example, masks in uh, cleaning staff. This is moderate ac physical action. We will also use people working as kitchen staff because in a kitchen, the ambient temperature is always higher. So if there is a higher uh, temperature or higher ma microclimate, between uh, the lips and the masks. Um, it might be that the higher temperature of uh, the room quickly gives a discomfort. And then we will also work with some people working in industry, then also some retired people and teenagers to cover a whole group of people and to be representative. Once we have selected our user group, we will do size determinations and production of the different community mask. And we will start the first prelim preliminary questionnaire to know some uh, information about the user, so, such as some demographic information, some health issues, white which might be related to the comfort feeling of a mask and then also their current mask preferences and acceptances to wearing a mask. So as sociodemographic data, we will ask gender, age, then also highest level of education, the current professional, whether they are retired or not, whether they work full time or not, their main occupation and also the sector they are working in. Some physical if important body data that also might influence uh, comfort feeling and fit of a mask, such as do you have a beard or a moustache? Do you have long hair, medium hair or are you, for example, bald? Then some uh, health data, is the person having a lung disease, is the person wearing glasses, and is he wearing glasses combined with masks, for example? Is there also a hearing loss, and is the person using hearing aids? And what about the st skin condition? Uh, is there a tendency for eczema, skin allergy, or formation of pimples? And then, for example, also is there a history of cancer and uh, chemo? For example, do you use a wig or not? And then some current masks uh, preferences and uses. And so if the user is used to wearing a mask, yes or no? And if yes, which type of mask? Is it a do-it-yourself community? or are a chirurgical or FFP masks? And then also, which types do you use? Are they reusable, disposable, or are both uh, used? And how long do you normally wear a, a mask? Four hours or, for example, only 30 minutes? This is uh, the overview of uh, some of the questions in Dutch for the democratic the socio-demographic data. Then here it is uh, also in Dutch for the health data. And here I've put it in English uh, for uh, acceptance of masks. I will go for this and then um, 
evaluation of the masks themselves. Uh, we will do a visual evaluation of the fit front and side photo of the user wearing the mask. Then we will also have a protocol for uh, some movements that they will have to make make for uh, infrared camera movie recording where we want to see leakage and display inhalation or exhalation of air and then we also have a second questionnaire which which will question the experiences with the different mask types and again we will uh, ask for example is it easy to put on do you wear glasses and did they vaporize what was the feeling of the fit uh, was the mask staying in place while you were wearing the mask and moving your head? If you were not active, were you sweating under the mask? How did the inside of the mask feel for you? Um, did you have the tendency to touch your face more often than without a mask? Did your eyes get irritated? So all questions related to the comfort feeling and to the fit of the mask. And then, of course, we will also ask an overall compression of the comfort feeling of the mask. So the outcome of the fit and wearing tests and of the research should, should be that we have measurement and size tables related to the different mask types or models, that we have an optimized fit for comfortable and performant community masks, that we also have optimized material selection guides for improving comfort in function of individual data, and that we have optimized gabardashery selection for mask models in function of individual data. If you have any question or if you want to contact us, these are our uh, contact data. Thank, Thank you very you. much for yes, listening. Yes. If there are questions, I'm yes. open for questions. There are a few also for uh, Joris. I'll start with Joris. So the first question is, uh, are the data sets you are using from Caesar where or more advanced data sets? Uh, we um, have some information uh, about the Caesar uh, database indeed, uh, but Caesar database is uh, mainly um, um, body measurements, um, yeah, body me measurements, but also some uh, head measurements. Uh, but the other nine databases where we are working with uh, are all um, um, for head and face, uh, with head and face measurements. So it's not only a CISA database, it's a great database, but um, uh, we, we found some other more sophisticated mm. data. Okay, thanks. Then another question, which materials are most recommended for the comfort masks? Yes, well, we will try to uh, give some guidelines. Um, but there, of course, uh, the fashion act aspect um, is also important. So I think at this moment there is a lack of information to choose uh, the right material which does not release any uh, hazards uh, or uh, products that might cause problems with skin or with inhalation. If we see, for example, a lot of masks are printed on with uh, transfer print, and I doubt that after the transfer printing, uh, they performed, for example, uh, Ecotex tests to see whether it is uh, safe to wear the, the mask so close to the skin. So I think we will give some guidelines but for comfort masks and do-it-yourself masks, since there is no standard applicable and people are free to use whatever they want, it will remain difficult. Mm -hmm. We can only, only say, for example, uh, don't use a T-shirt from uh, 10 years ago because it might uh, contain some... Uh, uh, dyes eh, which can cause allergy or for example even older textiles that uh, were perhaps dyed with naphthol dyes and they can release carcinogenic products and they are all yeah in available eh, uh, 
at this moment, but uh, we cannot avoid people uh, to use these things. And they, they cannot be bought anymore, naphtol dyes, but they remain uh, a problem for health. And for example, if we look into the closet of uh, our grandmother, it's quite probable that we will find some uh, things dyed with naphtol dyes. So mm -hmm. we can give guidelines and that they can, for example, go to a shop and buy a uh, Ecotex certified textiles, but then people still are free to do it or not. Yeah. Okay. And maybe I comment also a little bit further on this. We're also trying to evaluate different knits and woven fabrics also to see um, what the relationship is between the, for example, the density of a woven fabric and the filter efficiency also. We will try to give some guidelines also for the structure of the material and uh, yeah, passing of the requirements. But this is still ongoing, so we don't have any results of this yet, but we hope also from that part to be able to give some guidelines also later on. Yes, what is also important is that, for example, there is not too much fiber released, because if there is a fiber release, it will be inhaled and then it might or stay in the lungs, or come out and uh, be contaminated with, for example, bacteria or viruses as well. So it's quite uh, important to choose the right material, which is really safe. OK, thank you. The next question is for Ilse and Mark. And so it refers to an, uh, a Centex webinar where uh, somebody from DREAM presented and uh, he dis discussed filtration in surgical masks and um, where he explained that the principle is that uh, microorganisms are bound to larger particles uh, and these do not deflect from the airstream so contact the mask first when leaving um, the space behind the mask um, so if the mask retains uh, these uh, microorganisms and the air leaving the mask is therefore already filtered, why is fit then so important? A long question. Well, I think fit is uh, in the first place important because if there is a bad fit and if a mask isn't staying in place, people tend to uh, touch the mask to put it in place again and if in the, indeed uh, the mask is contaminated with bacteria or with virus they have it on their hands and they can contaminate themselves and others because they just touch the mask. Mm -hmm. I also think if the fit is not good people have uh, the tendency to wear the mask inappropriate eh? under the chin for example or uh, even uh, around the, the, the arms, etc. Yeah. And so it's quite yeah. important that the fit is good to feel comfortable and to uh, accept that we have to wear it. Okay. Yeah, um, and I would also think that you might have a, a lower risk to actually get infected yeah. yourself also from mm -hmm. that part, because a medical mask is really designed to protect the patient, but it doesn't protect yourself. So that's the principle that was explained by the 3M presentation. I've also seen it. But of course, if you have a comfort mask um, or a community mask, it might even help to protect yourself a little bit more if it fits re really well. So I guess also from that point, it might be interesting to have a well-fitted one. And also, of course, everything that Ilse already explained that it's good fit is actually quite important. OK. Good. I think it's also important that, for example, there are really uh, recommendations for cleaning the masks. And if you wear it, for example, four hours, that after that time it should be cleaned because otherwise you have quite a bio burden within the mask itself and then mm. We can doubt whether it's still safe to wear it longer. Yeah, indeed, that's also a good point. Uh, next question for Ilse. How do you measure moisture in the moisture management test? Is it an electronic sensor or swap or something else? Yeah, it's uh, it our uh, electronic sensor. So we uh, drop uh, on one side of the fabric and then uh, we measure um, 
je l'ai aidé par head. Conductivity. <laughs> conductivity, yes, thank you. We measure conductivity uh, on the upper side of the fabric and then also on the lower side. So it's a square and within the square there are different dots which are uh, sensors and then we can see, for example, whether uh, the moisture goes through the fabric quickly and whether it spreads or not, whether it says, for example, on the upper side of the fabric and if there is a spreading, whether it's, for example, uh, a spreading going from narrow to broad or that uh, the spread into uh, the fabric remains the same, that it just goes through the fabric. So we have quite some indication about uh, the behavior of a fluid with this moisture management test. OK, I see this is all for the questions uh, by now. Um, I would just like to show a last slide. So I would like to thank everybody for being present um, today. I hope it's clear for you that we are planning to um, continue our work on these masks. So. Um, we will keep you informed about our next activities and the results. As you see, we will do a test campaign for the fit and the comfort. So if you would be interested, just let us know. Uh, we can take you into the campaign. Um, as Ilse explained, we need a lot of different people just to be able to have uh, results. Um, if you have additional questions, so the questions that were not answered already in the in the chat, because I know there are still some for the speakers that uh, have presented before, um, we will uh, we will uh, answer them in the next days. If you have additional questions popping up in the next days or weeks, so send an uh, email to Ine, uh, who will forward it to the speakers that were involved or that can answer your questions. And I would say keep an eye on our website so it will be launched in January. Uh, there you will find our next activities as well and the results we have. But um, yeah, we uh, we will take into account the people that were uh, today present uh, that we will inform them on our next activities. So thank you for being here and hope to see you on a next occasion in the framework of the COVID PBM project.